Okay, good morning everyone. Before we begin, we'll take a quick tour around our presentation room. Please note that we have now turned on the recording function for archiving and playback. You are now being recorded. Beginning in the top right, you'll find a list of participants. If you run into any technical issues during the presentation, hover your mouse over my name, Dan Bolton, and a menu will appear to send me a private chat message. Below the participant list is the chat area. The chat is public and is recorded. Here you can post your responses to anything that might come up during the presentation. It's also an opportunity for the microphone shy to post questions to our presenters at the end of the talk. The main window is the projection screen for the slides, and above that you'll find a button showing a person with a raised hand. That's a pull-down menu for making the session a bit more interactive with options for a smiley or applause. After the presentation, we'll release the microphone for questions. To use your microphone, click the microphone button next to the little man wants to begin speaking and again to disconnect when you finished your question. Do remember to keep your microphone off when you're not speaking to avoid any feedback or background noises. And here we go. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the May session of the CIDR 2016 series from the Center for Distance Education at Athabasca University. As our regular audience members will know, we have over the years tended to give disproportionate attention to post-secondary education, a bias we're now trying to rectify with a number of initiatives, including a new program for K-12 teachers here at Athabasca. Thanks to today's guests, however, we have been very fortunate to have an ongoing mini-series, an annual tradition of State of the Nation reports on K-12 learning in Canada, reminding us that distance education reaches all ages in all regions of the country. After a break last year for our Community of Inquiry special season, the State of the Nation is back. Our speakers today are Dr. Michael Barbour, Director of Doctoral Studies at Sacred Heart University, south of the border in Connecticut, and Dr. Randy Labonte, CEO of the Canadian eLearning Network, or CAN eLearn in British Columbia. Dr. Barbour holds a PhD in Instructional Technology and a Certificate in Adult Education from St. Francis Xavier. His background, however, is rooted in the secondary level, and one of his research focuses has been on rural K-12 students learning in virtual school environments. He has been a teacher at Discovery Collegiate and director at the Center for Advanced Placement Education. His web-based advanced placement courses at the Center for Advanced Placement has drawn international attention, and he was invited to extend his work in the USA through the Illinois Virtual High School and worldwide through St. Brendan's College. Dr. Levante, in addition to his role at the Canadian eLearning Network, is a consultant in leadership and technology and an instructor at Vancouver Island University in its online learning and teaching program. Previously, he was a lead consultant and researcher for the BC Ministry of Education and on a team researching distance education for the Alberta government. He has developed policy, agreements, and e-learning standards, including the quality review process for online K-12 schools in British Columbia. A reminder to everyone, keep an eye on our site at cider.athabascau.ca for updates as we round out our season. You'll also find these slides and a recording of this session will be available in about two hours. I'm now passing the microphone to Drs. Barbour and Labonte. Feel free to use your applause buttons here. Everyone, welcome Dr. Michael Barbour and Dr. Randy Labonte. Thank you, Dan. That's... Uh, uh... Quite the introduction. I appreciate that, and uh, I note um, so a lot of activity happening in the chat already. And um, one of the things that uh, we'll try to do as we go through this process, uh, for the most part, I'm going to deal mostly with the the first half of the content, and then Randy's going to take over for the second half, and we'll sort of be watching each other um, in the text box. So if you have questions throughout, because uh, oftentimes a question that is important 10 minutes in by the time you get 50 minutes in is not necessarily as important to folks. So feel free to use the chat box as a way to ask questions as they come to you. And Randy and I will try to uh, keep an eye on that so that way we can um, try to address them as they're coming up. 
Um, so we've sort of got this presentation put together in, in two parts. Um, the first part is going to focus mainly upon sort of updating the information in the State of the Nation report. Uh, and uh, the second part is going to focus upon some examples of e-learning across the country that we're looking to highlight as part of the Canadian e-learning network. And uh, so I'll be doing mostly the first part and Randy will be doing mostly the second part. Um, so moving, I guess, along that, uh, the State of the Nation, as Dan mentioned, is a project that we've been um, involved with now for quite some time. Uh, this recent report, which was released uh, only this past month, although it is the 2015 report, so reporting on the data from the 2014-2015 school year, is the eighth that we've had in a series, um, and we've got sort of the covers there. As you can see, the uh, International Association of K-12 Online Learning, or INACL, were the main uh, folks behind that uh, initiative for the first five years, although in year five, as well as in year six, um, the Open School in British Columbia had been the um, main um, publishers of that report. Um, it's been the last two years that Can eLearn has uh, come on board, and that's largely in part because that's roughly corresponding with the existence of Can eLearn. And uh, I'm happy to be uh, working with them and, and colleagues like Randy uh, through that initiative. Um, just to give you a, a little bit of background on, on Can e Learn, uh, first of all, and Randy can add the URL in the text box there so that way uh, it will show up uh, as a linkable item. Uh, but the Canadian e Learning Network is a organization that really was about two or three years in the making that uh, as we were putting together uh, a pan-Canadian organization that was looking at how we use technology in sort of innovative ways within the K-12 environment. Uh, both in online and blended settings, so both in our distance settings but also in our face-to-face -face settings. And the organization was really designed to uh, bring a, a group of professionals from across the country together to be able to share resources, to provide PD, and to promote research initiatives like the, the one that we're talking about today. Um, and it's been a really interesting journey that we've had with the organization. Um, we've been involved with a number of uh, professional development and face-to-face -face meeting initiatives. And uh, while Randy will likely talk a little bit more about it later, uh, we will have our first national event coming up um, next April. Um, in uh, British Columbia, so that would be something to sort of keep on your radar screen if this is a community that uh, is of interest to you. Um, so looking at um, the mission, and I do want to put this up because it is something that um, the one of the successes, I think, of this research over the last eight years has been an increased interest in an organization of uh, this particular space that we have uh, when it comes to K-12 e-learning. And um, it, it's something that's nice to see coming out of, of the actual research. So um, as Randy has po pointed out in the uh, chat box there, the URL specifically for the State of the Nation K-12 e-learning in Canada report uh, is there, and you can click on the link in the chat box and it'll take you right out there. And that essentially is a clearinghouse for all eight editions of the report as well as um, pretty much all of the information there. Now I'll be honest and say that the provincial and territorial information that you find on the interactive map that's there hasn't been updated with the 2015 information yet. Uh, that's actually my May task to do, uh, but um, the actual, each of the reports are there, um, and as Randy points out in the chat box, under each of the provincial items, all of the vignettes, uh, which were designed to sort of put some um, flesh around the bones, if you will, about what the state of online blended and distance education actually looked like on the ground in each of the provinces, as well as an examination of some of the brief issue papers that we've had, um, are all available there, organized both by topic as well as by uh, provincial or geographic focus. Um, before I get into the data, I'd be remiss if I didn't thank the sponsors of the report. Uh, for the last two years, the Manitoba First Nations Education Resource Center have been the ones that have actually been doing the copy editing and the publishing of the actual PDF and the um, the uh, um, the print versions that we've had. 
Um, and we have some longtime sponsors in, in the LEARN program out of Quebec, as well as Heritage Christian Online Schools and the Virtual High School out of Ontario. Uh, Nelson Education is a new sponsor for us this year, and we are very happy to have them on board. And in all honesty, over the past number of years, I suspect this initiative would have died out after the first two or three years, had it not been for the fact that the sponsors have continued to, um, you know, support the, the publication as well as and encourage us to continue with it. So looking at um, a, a couple of things, one of the first things I want to start off with is you'll note that uh, you may have noticed on the title, in previous years this has always been called State of the Nation K-12 Online Learning in Canada and for the first seven reports that's how it was described and that really had to do with the way in which the field was set up when we first started doing this eight years ago. Um, for the most part, the report focused specifically upon online and distance education. We did make some passing reference to blended learning from time to time, although that was often in relation to what online or distance programs were doing in that space. Um, we were really sort of following the, the keeping pace with K-12 online learning reports that were coming out of the U.S. and for that matter, the state of the state reports that uh, had been published by Tom Clark prior to that. Um, using sort of this definition of what we were really focusing upon um, in terms of the report. But that started to change over time. And, and in the U.S., we saw, you know, the Keeping Pace reports went from being just the Keeping Pace with K-12 online learning to Keeping Pace with K-12 online and blended learning. And then after two years of that, we saw a shift that, you know, they changed the name to Keeping Pace with K-12 digital learning. Um, even the Virtual School Symposium, which iNACL had been running for about five or seven years at that point, um, changed their name from the Virtual School Symposium to the iNACL Symposium on Online and Blended Learning. Um, even north of the border here in, in Canada, and I think this is really what set off how we reframed um, looking at the report and looking at the issue. Um, in 2009, the Canadian Council for Learning uh, released a report called The State of E-Learning in Canada. And while it had primarily a higher ed and corporate focus, they did give a couple of nods to some of the K-12 um, environment that was happening out there, actually referencing these our State of the Nation reports. And then when we came together to create the Canadian e-learning network, um, as you might imagine, what to actually call ourselves and what to use as a name was one of the main things that we talked about for a, a very long time. And eventually, as Randy's noted in the text box, um, e-learning was the thing that we came up with that um, we felt was at least the most encompassing. And specifically using this kind of definition that the Canadian Council for Learning put forward in their particular, in their state of uh, the e-learning in Canada report. And we thought that this was, was quite useful. Um, so it really sort of captured what we felt was happening both in terms of those programs that were offering things at a distance regardless if they were using legacy or more traditional types of um, technologies to more recent types of technologies like web-based delivery and online delivery and even mobile delivery. But it also captured that idea of things that were happening in the brick and mortar classrooms. Um, things that um, we were looking at in terms of a lot of the stuff we're seeing with blended learning or digital learning or in the U.S. it often gets called things like personalized or customized or individualized instruction, um, which generally uses technology in hand in hand. So this was sort of how we felt uh, the best way of capturing this. So with that in mind, if you sort of look at how we've gone about this over the years, essentially we've tried to rely upon the ministries of education as our main source of information, although from province to province, depending upon how um, responsive the ministries have been, we often use key stakeholders as well as document analysis, looking at those. And starting in 2011, we also incorporated a uh, individual program survey, so we were actually collecting a fair amount of data from directly from the programs, although we've always had difficulty getting a good response rate from those folks. Um, so looking across the country, you've got a wide variety of um, things happening in, in across Canada on the K-12 e-learning front. Um, when you're looking specifically just at distance education programs, you see out east, or at least in Atlantic Canada, it's primarily 
um, single province-wide programs that are run by the ministries, whereas as you start to hit uh, into Quebec, basically they have primarily district-based programs. In some cases they have provincial reach, but they are based um, you know, at an individual level. And then moving across uh, the, the country, it sort of varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Um, with you know the ministry having some level of involvement in certain places, either directly or indirectly, or through contracting with the, you know individual school districts to provide a provincial reach, to the ministry having really no involvement whatsoever. Um, so, looking at I guess the level of activity, um, it's interesting to note that you know there are roughly five million um, K-12 students across the country, and we have just over. 300,000 or actually just less than 320,000 of those or just above 6% of those folks that um, are learning at a distance, not necessarily that are involved in e-learning, but are just specifically learning at a distance. If we were to include the percentage that we're able to capture, at least data-wise, that are learning in a blended fashion, that number actually goes up to about 12% right now. And that's just the ones we're able to capture. And, and I, uh, Randy and I estimate that we are probably only, when it comes to the blended learning context, able to capture only a very small, I would even say insignificant portion of the amount of blended learning that's actually happening uh, throughout the country. To give you a sense as to how this might have changed over the, the last year or two, you'll see that um, here's our data from the 2013-2014 school year lined up against our data from the 2014-2015 school year. And you'll note that in some cases there's a decrease in individual provinces, in some cases a small increase. Uh, you'll note that overall, at least based on these numbers, it appears that there's been about a 15,000 student decrease uh, during that time period. Um, one of the reasons I sort of show this particular chart when I talk about this is to talk about the availability of data. And as Randy has noted in the chat box there, you know, the data that the ministry collects is greatly variable from province to province, territory to territory. Uh, some can tell me the exact number, and I'll use British Columbia and Newfoundland as an example in this, you know, where the folks in BC can tell me that, you know, there are 100 or 78,499 students involved, and they can even tell me how many of those enrollments of those 78,500 students were responsible for. They can give me the percentage male and female, so on. They, you know, they keep the data at a very granular level. Whereas other jurisdictions really, you know, I'll use Ontario as a good example, where the ministry doesn't keep any sort of data in terms of, of the number of students that are actually involved. They can tell you roughly how many students are enrolled in their provincial LMS. Uh, oftentimes, two or three or four years later, they can tell us how many students they estimate were learning at a distance, but usually that's uh, quite a delayed kind of figure. And in some cases, the estimates that get provided are, are dramatically incorrect. Uh, I'll point to Quebec as an example here. Uh, you'll note in 2013-2014, Quebec had um, the 70,000, roughly 70,500 students involved, and then in 2014, 2015, um, they had approximately 43,763, and that seems like it's a significant drop. Um, one of the interesting things that we discovered when we were collecting the 2014, 2015 data is even though that figure of 70,000 500 had been a pro provided by the Ministry of Quebec a year earlier, and we always send them a draft of our profile to see, you know, make sure that we've captured what they've sent to us correctly. They signed off on it. Um, when we approached them the following year, so when we approached them for the 2014-2015 data, they indicated to us, well, you know, that number that you published last year that we sent you, that we approved, actually wasn't correct. The number was actually closer to like 28,000. Um, you know, so that number for that particular year was inflated by you know, some 42,000 folks. And if you were to take that 42,000 um, away from the total there, you see that, uh, you know, the number of the participation level from last year to this year didn't actually decrease at all. It actually increased by about 30,000. And, um, you know, so, and that's just one example of sort of not just the variability in data, but 
whether or not we have good data. You'll note, you know, over half of the columns there have tildes in front of them indicating that they're estimates or approximations. In some cases, the approximations are fairly specific, and that might just be because one or two of the programs that we approached were only able to give us approximates, but everyone else was able to give us definitive numbers. The ones that are closer to round numbers, like Ontario, Saskatchewan, and Alberta, um, as you know, primary examples, those are ones that are largely extrapolations on our part based upon our individual program data, um, because the ministries in those cases don't keep good data or don't keep any data in some cases. Um, so when you sort of you know take into account the corrections that we found in some of the data, this is what we've seen since we've started. Uh, keeping track of these numbers. So uh, the first statistic that you see there from 99-2000 came from um, the Canadian uh, Teachers Federation actually did a study looking at distance education across Canada and estimated that there were about 25,000 students and you can sort of see the growth that has happened um, throughout that kind of period. And each year we've seen some growth. Uh, some years we've seen greater levels of growth than others. Uh, but um, I, I wouldn't, I would caution against sort of interpreting that data strictly in that way. In some cases, it's just been we've gotten better at collecting the data in terms of a research team at the State of the Nation. Um, in other cases, it's the ministries have actually, as we've started asking this question annually from them, have started to pay a little bit more attention to that particular uh, information. So I want to basically take you quickly across the country because you can download the report itself and actually read through what's happening in each of the provinces, territories, as well as under the federal jurisdiction. Um, so I'm just going to sort of give you the highlights in terms of what may have changed from the previous year. Each of the provincial and territorial and federal profiles are about a page to a page and a half in length, so they only take you a couple of minutes to read if there's one in particular. Uh, but I'll sort of go through and mention any real differences that I've noted or that we've noted over the past year. So looking at Newfoundland and Labrador, there haven't really been any changes in either the regulation or in the nature or type of programs. Um, we did note that there was a slight increase in the level of participation from last year to this year. Uh, similarly with Nova Scotia, there was no change in the way in which the programs uh, they had as well as which they were regulated. Uh, for those of you that are sort of new to this study, I will mention in the case of Nova Scotia that the way in which it's regulated is actually kind of unique in that um, it's the only province or it's the only jurisdiction, I should say, in Canada where um, most of the regulation actually comes from language in the collective agreement that the government signed with the Nova Scotia Teachers Union. Uh, so that's sort of an, an interesting twist. Um, and as you can see there, that there was a little bit of a decrease in the level of online and distance participation. But through some of the things that those online programs were doing, um, there was actually a significant increase in the level of blended activity. And we were actually able to track it uh, for the first time this year. Um, Prince Edward Island still does not have any programs. Uh, they got rid of them recently, or I guess about four years ago. Uh, they continue to utilize the no New Brunswick program. You also saw a significant decrease, um, well, as significant as when you're dealing with double-digit numbers could be. Um, and similarly, no change in regulation. Um, New Brunswick, again, following sort of that consistent model where we didn't see a change in the type of programs, the number of programs, or in the nature of regulation. Uh, this is the first one that has followed this model, but you'll see it coming up in a number of times. Uh, the nature of regulation in New Brunswick is essentially they have a ministerial handbook that districts and schools have to agree to in order to participate in the province-wide program. And you'll see that that's a trend in a number of different jurisdictions as we move across the country. In the case of New Brunswick, it's actually about a 130-page handbook uh, that details out in very granular ways uh, the nature of things that schools have to do in order to participate. Um, in the case of Quebec, again, no change in the regulations or in the types of programs. We did see a slight increase in the level of participation once we got the corrected numbers from the previous year. Um, Quebec is also the uh, second jurisdiction, you'll note, that has no specific policies with, relate, with regard to um, how distance education is regulated. Newfoundland was the first, and that's also a trend that you'll see. Uh, there are four or five jurisdictions where they really have no policies in this 
regard whatsoever. Um, Ontario, there wasn't a discernible change, and I say a discernible change because in the case of Ontario, the province, at least for the public school districts, provides an LMS and course content, and it's up to the individual districts to manage their own programs. Some districts run programs, other districts choose not to, and really it depends upon who's responding to our individual program survey on a year-to-year -year basis as and what our key stakeholders are telling us in terms of whether or not that number is increasing or decreasing in terms of the number of programs. Um, to the best of our knowledge, it's remaining quite consistent. Uh, we've seen a slight increase in the level of distance participation, and we've seen a great increase in the level of blended learning. And again, I think part of that is because of that provincial e-learning strategy that they've got that is actually not just encouraging blended learning, but has set targets for the percentage of blended learning that's going to occur. Um, no changes really in what we've seen in Manitoba. They did have a little bit of a decrease in the level of participation, and they are in the 2014-2015 um, the school year was the second um, year of a provincial virtual school pilot that they've been engaged with, with actually um, the Wapaskawa uh, virtual school, uh, which is done run by the, the Manitoba First Nations group that are sponsors of, uh, or that are the publishers of this report. Uh, so it's going to be interesting to see over the next two to three years how that particular pilot program is going to influence how things change in Manitoba. Um, and I suspect that we will see some changes in Manitoba because of that. Uh, Saskatchewan actually went through a number of changes about three or four years ago, and they don't have any changes to report on from this past year. They have about a dozen and a half district-based programs. Uh, you're seeing a, actually a fairly high increase in the level of participation. And in the case of Saskatchewan, because they have this distance learning course repository, uh, there is some level of participation amongst districts. Um, Saskatchewan was one of those jurisdictions that did have policies at the provincial level when they were running provincial level programs and when they essentially got out of the business of directly running programs, they also got out of the business of creating any specific policies around that. Um, Alberta is a jurisdiction that has not had any policies, and while they've had a number of initiatives to try to change that, um, you know, dating back to really 2006-ish, uh, that they have never really come to pass. So there's somewhere in the vicinity of about 20 to 25 um, specific programs in the province right now, um, ranging from district-based programs to private programs to the Alberta Distance Learning Center, which is the pro, uh, province-wide program. And we're continuing to see consistent levels of participation, at least at a in the distance environment. Um, there is a sense within the province, although, again, the ministry is not collecting data on this, that the percentage of blended learning is increasing. I'll note that um, they actually created a specific blend ed conference last year, uh, which Candy Learn was actually responsible for managing. Um, and, uh, you know, that one is continuing again this coming fall. So um, I think that as Alberta starts to engage in a process and maybe get to the point where they are actually collecting specific data or looking at regulation that um, we may start to be able to capture a, a more robust picture here. Um, in the case of British Columbia, this is actually the jurisdiction that has the highest level of regulation throughout Canada in, in terms of its how it regulates uh, distance and uh, learning or distributed learning as they would refer to it. And um, it also has consistently the highest level of participation, although others are starting to gain ground on it, both in terms most years in actual numbers of students, but also in terms of percentage of proliferation. Um, they have in the vicinity of 60, approximately 60, I think it's just less now, um, online programs throughout the province or distance programs throughout the province, a mixture of both public programs and independent programs. And it's the only one that really has significant provisions in the Schools Act or the Independent Schools Act that govern how distance learning is taking place. Um, moving across to the territories, the, the Yukon is actually an interesting one because um, they continue to have a single territorial-wide program. They continue to use programs from Alberta and British Columbia, 
But they also have this blended learning pilot program that they've been using for the last couple of years, which has been growing significantly. Um, and when you're looking at the level of distance participation as well, it tends to be due to that blended learning pilot that uh, uh, has been um, you know, implemented there. And it's one that we're watching really closely as uh, researchers because it uh, it's one of the sort of more... Um, planned initiatives that uh, we've seen across the country. So it's going to be really interesting and exciting, I think, to see how this rolls out. Um, looking at the territories, again, no changes there. Uh, they do have an online pilot that has grown out of the Beaufort Delta Educational Council's online program that was run there. Uh, so they're now using that as a territory-wide pilot, and they continue to use programs from the ADLC, the Alberta Distance Learning Center. Um, and similarly with, oops, hit the wrong button. Uh, similarly with uh, Nunavut, we have um, you know no changes there. They continue to use the ADLC as their main provider. Uh, they have been exploring uh, the creation of policy around distance education, which they hope uh, would be a jumping-off point to being able to create uh, some sort of pilot program that they would run, so that they would no longer have to use programs. Uh, from the southern provinces. Um, the last one I want to mention is federal programs. And for those of you that aren't familiar, um, the programs that are being run directly by First Nations, Métis, or Inuits, um, or at least their educational authorities, oftentimes band councils, fall under federal jurisdiction in Canada. Uh, while many of these will follow the provincial curriculum, they are actually fall under the authority of uh, the federal jurisdictions. Um, now, for a while, that actually was a sort of a more meaningful process because the federal government would actually enter into direct service agreements with these e-learning programs. Um, two years ago, the um, federal ministry decided to begin to um, phase those out. So last year was actually the first year that they no longer entered into those agreements. So really now what you find is that the um, these online programs, for the most part, are either um, running largely as provincial entities or they are um, acting largely as um, uh, private entities that are chasing whatever funding source that they can um, contact. And because of the change in the service agreement aspect of it, um, what you find is that some of the programs like Credenda uh, While well, some of the programs are struggling to continue to exist, and in the case of Credenda, they ceased operations because of that very reason. Um, so looking, you know, that's sort of a, an overview of, of how the report sort of shakes down um, and, you know, how um, each of the provinces go. I sort of went through that quickly because I wanted to, you know, spend at least half of our time with the, the second portion, and I'll hand this over to Randy here now. And uh, we'll sort of swap places in terms of the chat and the speaker um, to go in and, and really talk about some of the programs that exist within these jurisdictions uh, to give you a sense as to um, really sort of, you know, within these regulatory contexts or within, you know, whether it's a, you know, a private or district-based or public program or province-wide program, um, what does that actually look like on the ground? So uh, over to you there, Randy. Thanks, Michael. I uh, appreciate that. And uh, let me see, I think I can remember how to advance slides, but if not, oh, there they are down the bottom left. Um, yeah, welcome all. Sorry, I've been a little chatty in the text box uh, about a number of different things. Um, what I wanted to speak to and uh, is, is some of the stories that are behind the, the data. It's one thing to do a macro view. Uh, it's another thing to actually begin to connect with some of the practitioners and see the practice uh, in a different light. Um, and that story is often not told. Um, and that's one of the pieces I think that's really kind of important. Um, and that's how we and why we form the network. We used to be meeting at the INACO Annual Symposium, and we'd be going, like, why aren't we having this conversation in Canada? Why It's nice to come to the States. It's usually, you know, we're south and nice weather. But, uh, you know, maybe we should be doing something in Canada. And that's sort of what, what happened. So what was interesting is we went back and measured ourselves sort of uh, against the practices that we had and the stories we were finding. 
uh, against sort of the INACO group as because it was the International Association for Online Learning. But um, what's interesting about that is that LEARN in Quebec, a program for, for the Anglophones uh, across uh, that province, uh, did apply for their uh, an innovation award uh, and won it in 2012 for their pedagogical instructional design and approaches. In 2013, Alberta uh, ADLC applied for an open MOOC and K-12 that uh, was uh, also got the top innovation award. In 2014, the Navigate Knife program, and there's actually going to be a, a webinar uh, an hour and a half from now uh, that is uh, outlining their particular program, and I'll try to remember to put the link in if you're interested in joining a collaborate session. Um, they came forward for some of their innovative programs and won the INACL Award. And then in 2015, uh, the uh, uh, Leadership and in Innovation Award was presented to Allison Slack for the eLearning Ontario Consortium, uh, which is a consortium of 20 plus boards uh, supporting online learning in, uh, for K-12 students there. She won the Innovator of the Year Award for her uh, services. So kind of interesting that um, that what's happened is that all Canadian programs um, in this awards piece uh, for the last four years have been, <laughs> been recognized. So I think it says something about the level of what's happening within the innovation there. A um, couple of things that are interesting around uh, what's happening in Alberta with the, with the Fort Mac fires, like in the Slave Lake fires in the past, um, that folks turn to Alberta Distance Learning Center. So ADLC and I can give you a link here with a little bit more information about ADLC, uh, is tapped to help support those students who have been displaced from their uh, schools and no longer have accessible to online resources uh, and support. But not only does ADLC um, manage this and pitch in, the connected groups in Alberta, the other online programs, also offer their help and support and assistance where it's possible through ADLC for that. So it's an interesting uh, kind of model and approach, and you don't really get the sense of what's um, in that rich context uh, just looking at, at numbers. So that's part of the story which we're beginning to tease out through the network and what that we're hoping to see uh, come forward. So what we did find in Alberta when we did this is from the research that was conducted uh, before for Alberta Education. There was a lot of homeschooled students which don't uh, necessarily get counted by Alberta Education. So um, there was a sort of a drive towards innovation in Alberta. Now, as those of us who are familiar with what's going on in Alberta know that that's been dampened by a number of things, not the least of which is the economic downturn and then what's happening in Fort McMurray. Um, but there's a pretty strong drive for innovation and, pro and engagement and results. Um, what's unique about Alberta is the, the initiative to move SuperNet for ostensibly for video conferencing purposes. Uh, but did lay down a really strong pipe in my work with uh, Alberta North before and eCampus Alberta to a certain extent uh, in going out to some of those outlying areas as well. And, and uh, certainly Kevin can speak to that uh, through NLC. Um, but the pipe is dropped into some of these remote communities and that creates a hub for learning and a hub for access and a hub for information. And those, those hubs typically are, are uh, run through some of the, the uh, comprehensive community institutions, the colleges themselves but also in some K-12 spaces and places. That has created a shift, obviously, to a lot of online communications and a lot of synchronous opportunities that are there, and now also a large, large use in, in uh, Alberta and shifting towards GAFE, uh, Google Apps for Education. Um, so that is another consistent piece that's happening, and to, to redesign a curriculum towards flexible high school approaches have, have really created a groundswell of support and need. There is a very strong Moodle user group that is formed throughout the K-12 uh, community there. And then, as, as Michael mentioned before, this blended uh, group, which is looking to bring the kind of practices forward, support other practitioners and educators together, um, which uh, now uh, they've also put a position in Alberta Education for an online learning coordinator and have actually hired someone from one of the programs, which is always a benefit. So that's some of the stories that are going on behind that. In British Columbia, where I did a lot of uh, consulting over uh, a number of years, um, has a reasonably large population, but a large number of independent schools as well that are moving into online. 
And what's interesting about it is when we look at completion rates uh, for this, and I don't know whether this is going to show up yet. Does perfect. I didn't realize the animations would show. Completion rates in British Columbia, as just as these programs are beginning to become rich and, and known, were the completion rates were less for those students that were actually taking an online course. And in BC, every student that takes an online distributed learning course, uh, every school district has to register with them. They, they have to provide data. So it is strictly measured. Um, the completion rate was poor, but if you look in uh, the last year that this was this data was taken, completion rate was higher. It's what you would expect uh, to a certain extent, but it also speaks to the quality improvements that are starting to happen in terms of achievement and completion in the online programs. It's just not a dumping ground. It's just not uh, last resort correspondence um, that is beginning to happen. So programs are shifting and changing uh, in there. And some of this shift and change uh, is happening uh, grassroots. So I mentioned about Navigate Nides, and uh, I will go dig their, their URL. Out. I'm not sure, Michael, if you actually found that or not. Uh, but the, um, but the, uh, what's, what's happening is changes are occurring because uh, educators are devoted and committed to having student success. Uh, and so they're looking to work outside. There's the link to the webinars. Um, they're looking to outside. In Coquitlam, the Inquiry Hub is taking an inquiry focus, and they're kind of throwing out the structure to a certain extent, and not just lining kids up in desks in uh, classrooms. So they're looking to extend out using technology and online spaces. And the same is happening, obviously, in independent schools as well. At this, so so it's becoming a bit of a a hodgepodge, shall we say? So in Navigate Nights uh, case. Uh, they've created different academies. Um, they've created different programs. They're taking advantage of space in the school building because of declining enrollment, and they're moving um, those spaces to become part of a program. But they're not requiring students to necessarily attend all the time. So they're pushing a lot of the online learning, uh, learning into online virtual spaces, and they're doing a more facilitated approach of, of teaching students uh, co-creating and look, working at projects and models as being uh, their approach to do that, while providing support for students who are need emotional social um, support often for some of the issues that they face, and putting a lot of the uh, pedagogical uh, instructional pieces into the online spaces. Um, so, so what we found certainly is happening here uh, across Western Canada in Ontario as well. I'll just run these all through. Um, there's a blur. <laughs> Practice, it's hard to say that it's just online because those programs that were online are trying to build some face-to-face -face supports in for students uh, and do expect uh, some attendance to a certain extent in some physical location. It might be a classroom, it might be in their school, but it could be in a community uh, space and teachers will, move, will go to them. Um, those that were working exclusively online, it's more difficult to try to bring it, go into the physical spaces, whereas the reverse is a little bit easier. But there is a drive for personal and flexible. Um, and nationally, First Nations and Francophone are probably a little bit more connected uh, and organized. Uh, but they're also sometimes more marginalized in terms of what they get from mainstream and level support. So again, one of the initiatives we're trying to do in CanyLearn is to bridge, build connections, and build some support mechanisms for them. No matter what we do, the research focus on getting better data is still a, 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 you know, a cry for <laughs> there's a strong need. And I think Mike, Michael will speak to that a little bit more. So in essence, in summary, so online programs are evolving from distance, that distance education correspondence. Um, there's more of a shift from classroom to online that's happening. Um, called blended or hybrid in post-sec, if, if you like. Uh, we're trying to avoid using too many terms because education jargon gets dated uh, and tainted quite quickly. So others are starting to use classroom teachers uh, in the buildings to be their online teachers. So they're really doing a mix of both uh, physical on-site and online. Uh, and there's others that are emerging towards more synchronous online. So live meetings, live web conferencing opportunities, live uh, office hours for teachers to be available to students. And in Ontario, um, they've centralized the resources. And what was interesting about it, they had a provincial license for desire to learn. 
at the LMS, uh, and it was restricted to just those programs that were offering online and at a distance. They then opened it up to classroom teachers to be, have access to the courses and, and, and the system, and it just totally exploded the use, uh, which was an interesting approach uh, and, and, and uh, observation for that. And the same thing in uh, Michael mentioned in Atlantic centralized approaches, and they're building local partnerships and far more, um, shall we say, um, cohesive and collaborative, uh, Nova Scotia being one I think that's really important is how they work with their teachers uh, and have a, one centralized program. Uh, because of the size of the program and the province, it's akin to doing, say, it's one of the large, say, Peel or Durham uh, boards in Ontario. So it um, tends to be like that. And let me stop there, Michael. You got anything else that, to add in here and things that I might have missed in the text? I think we can both have our mics going at the same time. <laughs> yeah, no, I hit mute and it didn't automatically go right away. And then I hit it again and I mute it myself again. Sorry about that. Uh, no, I don't have anything specifically to add there, Randy. Um, you know, I mean, you've covered it. We've got about 15 minutes and I've been trying to sort of get catch the questions as they've been coming through as you did. But um, I guess we're sort of mainly getting close to the, the end of, of the the formal portion of our um, talk and we want it to actually provide a bit of time because knowing that these sessions are often smaller and a little bit more intimate, folks often come with specific things that they're hoping to learn a little bit more about or questions they're hoping to have answered. So we want it to provide ample time to be able to address those kinds of issues. Yeah, and just this is a model that I put together which describes what I had, had talked about uh, as best as I could. So yeah, it, it's it's open for dialogue, conversation. I think there's things that are happening because I've bridged in my my work in both post-secondary as well as in K-12, to and uh, my bias is obviously I'm situated in Western Canada, so have a little bit of that, uh, that perspective there. But um, you know, I, I see a lot of parallels and similarities, um, and Kevin in particular with the, the work around some of the NLCs, satellite campuses, etc., cetera, um, have the same similar issues and struggles as some of the online programs and some of the school districts that are trying to move online. So Northern Lights, uh, Northern, um, you know, uh, schools, others, etc., do have their own struggles within connectivity, uh, connection, access, but um, they're moving towards a much more of a digital space and presence. And I think, Kevin, you asked the question around uh, standards, and maybe we could talk a little bit about standards, Michael, because they there is a bit of a, a collection around standards um, that initially started in some of the K-12 online programs. Um, Ministries of Education sort of pursued that. But I think have dropped back, and it goes back to one of the questions, which I think that Vivian had also talked about, about ministries of education in the provinces don't really tell school authorities, school divisions or boards, how they deliver services. They set expectations around uh, what those services may be in curriculum, uh, in terms of what needs to be addressed, and policy and legislation and funding levels with, within which to do that, but the autonomy remains there. So a lot of standards uh, has shifted towards the professionals and organizations such as Canny Learn or in Alberta's KC Campus, Alberta or BC Campus, and they're not standards per se as they are uh, looking towards exemplary practices. Michael, maybe you have something to add on that conversation with a bit of a sidelight going on while you were presenting. Um, yeah, I saw it going through and, and I saw sort of your feedback on it, which is why I sort of didn't um, add anything to it because I thought that you were covering it adequately. I mean, um, and I think you have from a Canadian context, you know, as someone who's been working in the U.S. for uh, over the last decade now, there's, um, you know, obviously a number of initiatives south of the 49th parallel that um, have tended to get a little bit of play in our particular area, but for the most part, um, you know, with the exception of the, the formalized standards that British Columbia have come up with as a part of their e-learning or the distributed learning framework, um, you know, that's really the only time those have even been sort of considered or taken into account. Um, I see Vivian has her uh, hand raised, so I'm going to, um, if you just want to unmute your mic, Vivian, and you can uh, ask a question. <laughs> 
Okay, uh, well, thank you, Michael and Randy, for this wonderful presentation. Actually, I'm from Brazil, and that's why I was asking about you know, this policy. And here, the Ministry of Education dictates uh, what's going to be done in, in K-12 and, and higher education as well. So, very interesting presentation. I have two questions for you. Uh, one was when you mentioned that shifting from classroom to online uh, appears to be easier than from online to be uh, to blended, and I wonder if if you have any you know assumptions or why that would be the case. So that that would be my first question. Uh, I'll jump in on that. And essentially, for those that are online, they are often relegated off into small corner spaces. They don't have the physical assets and access to rooms and spaces and places. Uh, for students to come in, or they're not centrally located in a place that's accessible for students. Um, so the shift has been towards moving into, with declining in physical enrollment, uh, they've tried to take over old classrooms, old schools to build in that kind of a space, or sometimes in some cases lease um, spaces in community. That's a little bit more problematic than if you're actually sitting in a physical space already as a teacher. All you have to do is build an online presence. You can, there's some free web tools that you can do that with. There's uh, other LMS access that might be used. Or, um, you know, Edmodo is used a lot for online communities for uh, engagement with students. So it's the digital tools are right at your fingertips if you're in the classroom. Whereas if you're online and isolated, it's sometimes problematic to get a physical space to bring kids to for appropriate, uh, you know, instruction and in what you want to do. You, you had hopefully that answers. Um, if I could jump question. in on that a little bit as well. Yeah. Actually, if I could jump in on that a little bit, Randy. Um, the other issue I think is that there have been a number of jurisdictions that um, have actually, I think, fostered the classroom teachers to using online materials. So I look at like eLearning Ontario as part of their ministry unit or the two online programs that the French and English one that exist in New Brunswick. Um, in those cases they've actually sort of gone out of their way to create both the tools and the content and make those things available to the classroom teachers uh, whereas we haven't seen that kind of thing happening as much for those online programs. So I think that's another uh, aspect to, um, you know, Randy's statement about it being easier for the face-to-face fa -face teachers. Okay, that sounds good. Well, I look forward to reading your report on, on teacher uh, professional development. Uh, my second question, because I don't want a monopolized session here, and I, I think um, the, the, there might be others that might have questions, has to do with OER. Um, in your study, um, were any of the schools implementing OER? I mean, <laughs> did you find any data that has to be said? And I know um, that that is a big trend, and uh, that is something that K-12 wants to do. So uh, I, I, I didn't talk about that. But it's, uh, well, we didn't because um, it probably, I would say, is not it's one of the biggest struggles in K-12 to is the sharing of resources uh, and course content and courses. And the identity in many, many programs is that the course or the content is the program. They don't want to give it up because uh, in many jurisdictions, they're competing for students. In BC, it's open boundaries and open enrollment, and it's the same in, in certainly Alberta and other places. So there's a reluctance to do that. The Ontario's e-learning consortium formed uh, just to do just that, to share course accessibility, and they do share some resources. But as far as licensing under Creative Commons, um, far more prevalent in the post-secondary, and probably for the most part sporadically existent in some areas. Some school districts uh, will say, you were paid by us, it's our property, and they will copyright it and not share. There are some loose consortiums that are brokering and trying to share collectively to build resources that they can share within, but they're not licensed openly. Uh, whereas there's been a very strong push uh, through Athabasca University, through BC Campus, eCampus Alberta's and others, on open education resources in the post-secondary. 
uh, and building open textbooks has been a manifestation that is beginning to move. And policy and legislation in the, some of the provincial entities for post-secondary are beginning to make those shifts, less so in K-12. to Michael, you probably have a few comments on that too, or unless I didn't read them. No, I um, basically was going to defer that one to you because from a Canadian perspective, um, you know, what, I mean, as Randy noted, some of those jurisdictions, and I'll use Ontario as an example, depending upon how open you define open, you could say that they do have somewhat of an open system um, in that basically roughly a decade ago, the ministry decided to take everybody's content that they had been developing on their own, create these master courses that then they provided back to the pro online programs and eventually the face-to-face -face schools for free. Uh, but the thing is, is you have to be in Ontario to be able to access those things. So if you're part of the K-12 system in Ontario, it's completely open. If you're part of the K-12 system anywhere else, um, or if you're not a part of the K-12 system, it's completely closed. So, you know, again, depending upon how you define open, it, it um, you know, as Randy indicated, you know, it's, it's mainly happening in, in a higher ed sector uh, than it would be more in the K-12 sector. Um, Kevin, I noticed you answered or asked a question in the, um, the chat box about uh, trends in the U.S. system. Um, in all honesty, I could do a complete webinar just on that, uh, so I won't belabor uh, the issue. One of the things I will mention, um, and this I think is one of the biggest reasons why we created the Canadian eLearning Network in the first place, um, because as Randy noted, we had all been meeting at the International Association for K-12 Online Learning, which while it has the word international in the title, um, is mainly a U.S.-based organization. And one of the, I think, key um, issues in the U.S. right now is the fact that the online and blended learning movement have really become caught up in the neoliberal free market style privatization of public education uh, issue that we see happening as under the guise of educational reform in the U.S. So that's something that, um, you know, is, and so every time you're looking at things uh, that are coming out of the U.S. that even if they sound kind of good, like all the work you see coming out of, you know, this uh, idea of student-centered learning, personalized learning, and customized education, and competency-based education, you have to remember that the underlying premise that's coming out of all this is, you know, how do we open up the K-12 education market for corporations and how do we decrease the level of professional educators that are involved in uh, the enterprise of education um, and, you know, then read what you're seeing coming out of it through that light. Um, so if I could sort of talk about one trend in general, and it's one that we don't see happening north of the border, um, I think that would be it. And really that was, I think, probably one of the biggest reasons why we created the Canadian eLearning Network was because of that sort of disconnect between how we viewed public education and the kind of assault on public education that we saw happening in the U.S. and the role that uh, the advocacy groups around online and blended learning were playing in that. Um, I know Randy uh, seemed to have gotten disconnected there for a minute, so um, he probably didn't I hear most of that, but he knows what I said anyway because he's um, heard that little bit of a rant many, many times. So, um, But beyond that, I mean, like I say, I could do a complete webinar uh, Kevin, on just what's happening in, in the uh, U.S. Uh, context in terms of Okay, good. Uh, we have about one minute left in our regular scheduled program, so if anybody has any very quick questions, um, you can go ahead now by clicking the microphone on, click it again to turn it on. All right, so we have the contact information up, and it looks like everybody is uh, saying thank you.
So I will say that thank you as well. Thank you to our presenters, Michael Barbour and Randy Labonte, and thank you to our audience. And just a reminder that these slides are available at our site, cider.athabascau.ca, and a full recording of the session will be posted in about half an hour. And with that, we will bring the session to an official close and turn off the recording.